the prophets cry, yet still black men are doomed to die by those who wish to vilify. Kyrie It is enough, the harm must cease from warring madness by police who are sworn to protect, keep peace. We cannot wait, no more excuse for bias, hate, your savagery, we cannot take, Christe We have had enough of these charades. It is enough, we cannot wait. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. My name is Rob Walters. I'm one of the pastors here at the Cathedral of the Rockies. And we chose to begin worship today differently than most weeks. We chose to begin this week from, with this lament from the Reverend DeAndre Johnson. He is a United Methodist pastor from Texas, and his words capture our truth today. He sang these words, There are no words that can contain the depth of wounds our soul sustains. Each time a grieving heart exclaims, 
Kyrie eleison, Christ have mercy. Friends, we have much work to do in our world. We have confessions to share, repentance to ask for, but we have hope. We have hope to live, and that life comes not just through a hope of what is yet to come, but through action to make someone else's world better than it is today. We pray that you would join us in this work that we have to do. Kyrie eleison. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry for the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you join me in this call to worship? A love that never ceases, a creativity that designed the universe a hope that cannot be quenched. These are the things that are of God. God, our hope in you is not a wish, and it's not certainty. Our hope is built on the sacrifice and victory of Jesus Christ. We thank you. We worship you. Would you sing with me? Sing for 
for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. Will you now please join me in prayer? Dear God, be with us in this time as people suffer, as parents grieve, as violence rages. Be with us who feel the pain of loss, who feel anger at injustice. Be with the oppressed and change the heart of the oppressor. Help us to remember to hope, the hope we had to help us find a better tomorrow as we rumble with anger, sadness, and fear. Give us eyes to see our part in the problem and our part in the solution. Will you join me now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lay down. 
Today's scripture lesson comes to us from the book of Daniel, the third chapter, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Will you please join me? Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, dragon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of a blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and throw them into the furnace of a blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, True, O king, he replied. But I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of a blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servant of the Most High God, come out. 
come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of today's scripture. Thanks be to God. We are beginning a new sermon series about hope. And this word hope, we use it all of the time. We say things like, I hope my baseball team wins, or I hope I get good grades, or I hope my car keeps running. I hope, I hope, I hope. But in reality, we live in a world that is so deeply broken right now. We see violence, we see hate, we see war, we see pain, we see racism, we see oppression, we see pain and death. Hope is something we desperately need. But when we think about hope, the word that we use in English for hope, it, it means something a little different than what it means in the Bible. You see, when we look at the original language and we translate it back to English, the word hope in the Bible actually means a rope. It's a rope that you would offer to someone to help pull them up to safety. You see, it wasn't just a feeling of hope, but it was the action of offering something to help someone else. So perhaps maybe we twist our definition of hope just a bit. Maybe hope is living in a way that makes someone else's tomorrow better than today. Maybe that's the action that we are called to take to make tomorrow better than today for someone else. It's who we are as Christians. It's also played out in this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that you heard Pastor Debbie read. I want to highlight just a couple of verses as they tie into this idea of hope. First from verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. You see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're called to worship the king and to worship this idol, but they don't want to do it. It's this moment of injustice where they say, you can't make us do that. But they're threatened with immediate execution. Now, look who steps in. Here's verse 8. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. These Chaldeans, they took the Jews and, and threw them literally under the proverbial bus to the king. They said that these Chaldeans denounced the Jews. So who are the Jews in this particular scripture? Who is the one in danger of being thrown in the furnace and losing their life? Are the Jews those that are serving in the government? Because there were some Jews who were serving in government positions at the time. Were the Jews just the three of them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are they the ones in danger? Or even worse, is it all of the Jews? Did these Chaldeans see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the king and then threw all of the Jews under this proverbial bus in this moment of injustice. Scripture goes on like this in verse 17. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have courage. They looked right at the king in the face of certain execution for they and perhaps their people. And they said, we will not bow down. What they are doing is they are calling out injustice in the form of this forced worship of the king and of the idols the king had created. They challenged that moment, even when they risked their lives to do so. Verse 22 tells us more. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
You see this graphic moment where the anger of the king has overheated the furnace, and even the people helping the king are consumed in this graphic moment. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they seem to be fine. And one of the king's aides replies, But I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. Imagine this moment. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they've challenged this injustice. They have been thrown into the fiery furnace that consumed these other aids, and then all of a sudden, they are seen walking around inside the furnace with a fourth person who looks like a god. They challenged injustice, and God showed up. The message here for us is a, a simple one. It's that when someone is in the furnace, God is there too. You see, in our world right now, we feel like we are in the furnace. We are in a world where we are seeing racism played out in front of us on television. We see a black man in a park confronted by a white woman with a dog simply because of the color of his skin and the threats to call the police. We see the death of George Floyd under the knee of a police officer. These are horrific moments of racism played out right in front of us on our televisions. It is the moment that we see injustice taking place at its very worst. So as your pastor, I've been asking myself, how do I do better to challenge things like racism in our world? How do I do better to challenge injustice? So I ran on a blog this week that I wanted to share with you. It's a blog by a group called Change Started With Me, and these are steps to be an anti-racist, to work against racism in the world. They listed four steps. The first is awareness, then education, then self-interrogation, and community action. I wanted to take a short look at each one of those. The first one is awareness. And this is that initial realization of racial injustices. We begin to see them happening, right? With an understanding of privilege, to understand what white privilege looks like when we see and identify that injustice occurs. You see, these moments happen where we begin to see this more clearly in front of us when we begin to become more aware of our own privilege, when we begin to see things that are painful. Friends, I have people that come to me and will say things like, I'm not sure this injustice really occurs. I have to tell you, as a former police officer, I've worked with some people who were amazing, and they kept people safe. At the same time, I saw racial injustice very clearly played out in our judicial system, in our prison system, and in some police officers. Racial injustice is a real thing. I saw when I'd walk up to the car of a Caucasian person that they would be relaxed and comfortable with me, but when I would walk up to the car of a person with black skin, they would be fearful of me. That is racial injustice right in front of us. But I became more aware of it when I was a police officer than any other time as it played out right in front of me. We have to become aware. Secondarily, we have to seek education. That is the moment that we become an intentional student, that we choose to dig deep and we learn from webinars and lectures and workshops and classes and blogs and develop a foundational understanding of racial injustice. For me, this was seminary. I studied divinity or to get a master of divinity to be a pastor, and, and I've received a specialization in prison ministry and restorative justice. During that time, I focused hard on my thesis in areas like systemic injustice and how persons of color are treated differently in the judicial system and the prison system than others might be. I spent all of my research and time on that. But friends, I have to confess to you that since I left seminary, I haven't done much with it. I've taught a couple workshops, I've done a few other things, but I didn't really let that sink in deeply and make more difference in the world around us. We have to educate ourselves. We have to read. 
Victoria Alexander shared these lists of books that might be helpful to you and to me. If you're at a place where you're just beginning to seek an awareness of what racial injustice looks like, these four books in the starter kit may be helpful to you. If you're a little further down the journey, perhaps you're aware, but now you're really working to dig and to educate yourself and to do some self-interrogation, the books in the intermediate section in the middle may be helpful to you. Or perhaps you want to dig into a specific topic like poverty or the prison system or homelessness. You'll find some book recommendations there for you as well. You can rewind this tape later and write down a book or two that might be helpful to you. Friends, when I began to read, I began to understand more. It changed how I saw these issues of injustice. So I would encourage you to seek that important education that all of us need. Thirdly, is self-interrogation. This is the stage where true self-work begins, and we begin to leave behind defensive tactics, these things that we say and do to avoid talking about the issue. Instead, we begin to create self-accountability. We hold ourselves accountable for our thoughts and our actions, and we grow in our mindset. I find this to be one of the hardest places because even after studying and trying to become more aware, I find myself making mistakes. I find myself not looking deeply inside myself because the truth is all of us have a little bit of racism in us and some of us have more and some of us have a lot. But to think we have none means we haven't done any self-interrogation yet. I find myself in this phase a lot where I think I have something figured out and then I make a mistake and I have to look more deeply inside myself and say, Rob, why did you do that? You have to dig more. It's that moment of self-interrogation. The fourth step on this journey to be an anti-racist is community action. And it's when we incorporate what we've learned during this ongoing process into everyday life, we utilize the influence and the leadership we have in our homes or in our workplaces. In my case, here in the pulpit, we use that to encourage others in their own anti-racism journey. This is hard to do because I come up to share with you today in this place of community action, realizing that there are parts of me that are still in awareness, that I don't even realize that something I did or said or thought was unjust. There are moments that I haven't educated myself enough. There are moments that I haven't dug deeply enough to self-interrogate my own thoughts and my own actions. And there are other moments that I try community activism. The challenge is, is when we spend too much time doing community activism but haven't done the others, we make a lot of mistakes. And as your pastor, I can tell you I make them on a regular basis. Where are you on this journey? We're all in different places and sometimes at different times. But it is a process that we have to go on. Friends, I want to consider asking you a question today that might help you answer where do you think you are on that process. And the first is just a little simple test question, and that is, how do you see Jesus? Because it tells us a little bit where we are in terms of our understanding of injustice. How do you see Jesus? For example, when I was growing up, this is the Jesus I remember. A Jesus with white Caucasian skin and the white flowing robe and the blonde hair and the blue eyes, almost with the perfectly positioned fan blowing his hair at a distance. This is the Jesus I remember on the side of church walls and sometimes in homes and, and sometimes in versions of the Bible. That was the image of Jesus I saw. A Jesus that looked a little bit like me. But what did that say to my friends of color who looked at Jesus, but Jesus didn't look like them? You see, we look for systemic injustices in the world, but sometimes we don't look right in front of us. One of my colleagues, a district superintendent, Reverend John Tucker, had this on his page this week. He said, there are no white people in the Bible I'll let that just sink in for a few minutes. You see, when we begin to realize there are no Caucasian people, all the stories we are reading are people of color. Yet we place an image of a white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus on the side of many of our churches for years and years and years. It was a way that systemic racism creeps in 
to a place that we know and love and really don't intend to be harmful, but we haven't found a place of awareness enough to realize how damaging that can be. As I was trying to do some education for myself, I found an image of Chinese Jesus done by a Franciscan monk. This is located in a Chinese monastery. It was done in the late 1800s. An image of a person of color being Jesus instead of a Caucasian. Then there's this image of an inhabitant of Galilee. This is a facial reconstruction done by Mark Goodacre. He's a theologian at the University of Birmingham. And this is interesting because it's based upon the depictions in the Dura Europas Synagogue. And these are the earliest depictions or visual images known of early Galileans. They come all the way from 244 CE. That's what this image is based upon. Maybe this is what Jesus looked like. Then you have this facial reconstruction done by Richard Neve. He's a forensic anthropologist and medical artist from the University of Manchester. He said this is what a Jesus who was a Middle Easterner would have actually looked like. Maybe that's what Jesus looks like. And then Joan Taylor, a theologian at King's College in London, described this as the most accurate image of Jesus. You see, that's different than the Jesus I grew up with. That is an image that is more inclusive of all persons. Imagine if we hung those pictures on our wall and said, these are the most likely images of Jesus. You see, friends, when we dismantle a systemic, fictional image of Jesus, and we opt for a more accurate historical image, we are creating an inclusive theology. You see, we say all means all, but the image we place on the wall doesn't say that. If we want to have an inclusive theology, we have to change our understanding of who Jesus really was in history, not just the whitewashed one that showed up on our church walls. So I ask you again, where are you on the journey? If you're struggling to see Jesus in a more authentic skin color and imagery, then maybe you're in an awareness place today, or perhaps an education place. I learned more because I read more, and I looked for artwork, and I saw how others saw Jesus besides the image I had grown up with. Where are you on this journey? Another way to answer that question might be to see what your reaction and my reaction is to the phrase black lives matter. You see, because as a Christian, I should be able to clearly articulate black lives matter because they do. Oftentimes Christians will come to me and they'll say, well, why can't we just change that to all lives matter? Doesn't that sound better, pastor? And while there might be a good heart behind that desire because God does love all people. At the same time, it's missing the trauma and the injustice that calls us to say black lives matter. Reverend John Tucker put it this way in his site. He says, it's all about the ellipsis or the three little dots. You see, sometimes Caucasians like me, we like to put three little dots in front of Black Lives Matter, and then we like to try to insert words there. You see, sometimes my brain hears only Black Lives Matter or just Black Lives Matter, when in reality that ellipsis is not there. That's my own privilege that placed that word there. When in reality, I should be able to clearly articulate at the top of my lungs, Black Lives Matter matter. No ellipsis. We have to learn how to do that. If you're on that journey and you're struggling with that, maybe you're in that place of awareness or, or seeking some education to understand why. Friends, I have to confess as your pastor, I used to want to say that too. Well, all lives matter. But then I began to grow a little bit in my own Christianity and dug more deeply and said, that wasn't Jesus. Jesus said things like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine all of the disciples yelling, Jesus, what about those of us that aren't poor in spirit? Don't we matter too? You see, Jesus was making a point, and the disciples would have just undermined it. 
if they said, but all are actually blessed, not just the poor in spirit. What about this one? Blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Friends, I've done a whole lot of funerals where we focus on a grieving family and the death of a loved one. Imagine if as we were offering them a blessing and reminding them that they will be comforted, someone from the crowd shouted, well, what about all of our lives too? Aren't we blessed? When we do that, we miss the trauma and the pain and the grief in the moment. Then there's this one, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Can you imagine if the disciples said, well, what about those of us who are strong and have lots of money and have lots of power? Aren't we going to inherit the earth too? Jesus was trying to teach them something about those who were struggling. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. But Jesus, what about the rest of us? I mean, we're important too. It's not just about the hungry ones. You see how problematic that theology is. If we look at who Jesus is, really is. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' snake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus is spelling it out. Blessed are those who are persecuted or oppressed or put down by society. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. That's what we're seeing played out in the news right now with people walking in a park while black. And then there's this one verse that gets us in trouble. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And sometimes that, what that calls us to do is to say, listen, I'm okay with protests, but violence, I, I can't do that. And it comes from a good heart. None of us want violence. No one of any color wants violence. But the challenge is, when a person with white skin like mine says, I don't want the violence, but doesn't also say, I will work against injustice, we are missing a major point. Today is Peace with Justice Sunday in the United Methodist Church around the world. It's a day where we remember and focus on the idea that peace is important, but it comes with justice, that they have to go together. You can feel free to donate towards Peace with Justice Ministries around the world using the link on your screen. But this idea of peace and justice together, it comes from Scripture. We read words like love your enemies and, and forgive trespasses. These are justice moments. We see phrases like overcome evil with good, to take an action, not just a feeling of hope, to overcome evil we see words like seek peace and pursue it, which means we have to take an action towards justice in order to receive peace. Oh, friends, I went to a prayer vigil this week for people of color at the Capitol. This was a moment where thousands gathered at the Capitol seeking justice and seeking peace. Late in the evening, we lit candles. We had battery-powered candles that we lit up and they began to read the names of those persons of color who have been killed or murdered in racially motivated incidents. They read the names of those folks. I was there for about an hour, but I wanted you to hear about 40 seconds of it. Michael. Lorenzo. This was a powerful moment at the Capitol. The organizers of this event did an amazing job at creating awareness for us and helping us grow in our work to combat injustice. But I have to confess to you as your pastor, as they read the names of people of color, I knew some of them. I knew Ahmaud Aubrey and I knew George Floyd, and, but I didn't know all of them. And I felt like I'd returned to an awareness step on the continuum. 
that here they were reading names that because they hadn't flashed quickly enough across my television, I wasn't sure what their story was or what had occurred. It was a moment that I realized I needed more awareness if I was really going to work to combat injustice in the world. Friends, peace comes with justice. And as Christians, we are about peace, and that is important, but we are also about justice. We see that in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they challenge systemic oppression, forcing them to worship in a certain way at the risk of their own death only to find that God is in the furnace with them. Martin Luther King Jr. said it better than I can. He said, justice denied anywhere diminishes justice everywhere. Peace and justice have to go together. So we end where we began, and that's the idea that hope is a rope that hope is living in a way that makes someone's tomorrow better than it is today. Jesus was all about that. And you and I, we have to be about that too. How can we make tomorrow better than today for someone facing injustice? I want to give you these action steps as we close. The first one, allow yourself to go on the journey from awareness to education to self-interrogation to action. I'll be posting some links on our Facebook page. I want to encourage you to read through those and to go on that journey with me. And don't trust that your pastor has it figured out because I'll move forward a little and then I'll go right back to the beginning and have to start over. We work on it together. Number two, work to adjust your image of Jesus to one that's more accurate. I figured this out in my 30s. Hopefully you figure it out before that. Look for an inclusive image of Jesus, a more accurate historical image. Number three, read and educate yourself. Go back and look at those books that we put on the screen earlier in the message. Read and grow. I learned this in seminary, and I learned so much, but what I really learned is that I still don't know near enough. I would encourage you to read with me. And lastly, work for peace and justice together. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we lift up this world to you today. We lift up those who are facing injustice. God, we know that you fought for those who were facing persecution, who were facing injustice, those who were struggling, those who were on the margins. God, call us to have that heart Call us to have that heart all of the time in what we say and what we do. Help us to become more aware to educate ourselves. God, to dig deeply into our own heart and our biases. And God, help us to then work for justice in the world. God, we pray that your loving arms might wrap around all of your children, that we would truly be able to see the deep value in people with a different skin color or a different background or a different socioeconomic status or with a different language or that come from a different geographic area. God, help us when we say all means all to really mean it. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. We want to thank you so very much for your generosity through this season. You know, your generosity has helped us to feed those families who are hungry right now through the gift of gift cards, grocery gift cards. And just recently, the Amity Campus has been able to start a certified food pantry in partnership with Feeding America. We had 20 families just last Monday, our first Monday. We are open every Monday from 5.30 to 7.30, and all who are hungry and in need are welcome and invited to attend. It is through your generosity that we are able to fulfill ministries such as these. So we ask that you now give. The opportunities and ways in which to give are located right here on the screen. Thank you. Thank you for being a generous church. when the heart is on fire. Another-
I'm so excited to tell you about Vacation Bible School. We can't meet in person, but that's okay because the same fun that you know and love is coming straight to your doorstep July 20th through the 23rd, which means it doesn't matter where you live, you can join us. Registration is on our website, cathedraloftherockies.org. And if you would like to help make VBS possible, you can use the same link to sign up to serve or find a list of needed supplies, or you can mark your second mile giving for VBS. We look forward to seeing you there. Let the 
It's been a great joy to be here with you in worship today. Thank you for being here. Many of you have heard a benediction that reminds us that God lifts God's countenance upon us and gives us peace. Instead of that benediction, I want to share with you a benediction that was given by Bishop Woody White. It was in 1996 at the General Conference of the United Methodist Church in Denver, Colorado. Would you receive this benediction? And now, May the Lord torment you. May the Lord keep before you the faces of the hungry, the lonely, the rejected, and the despised. May the Lord afflict you with pain for the hurt, the wounded, the oppressed, the abused, and the victims of violence. May God grace you with agony, a burning thirst for justice and righteousness. May the Lord give you courage and strength and compassion to make ours a better world, 
to make your community a better community and to make your church a better church. And may you do your best to make it so. And after you have done your best, may God grant you peace. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you.